All right, welcome back. Uh, we've discussed to this point several parts of a business. The first if we discussed is the organization and structuring um, the idea about using the right individuals and knowing what the individuals are doing. And your A team, that's what you want to do is to make sure you have an A team, that you've got all areas covered. Then we discussed corporations, we discussed limited liability companies, and last time we discussed DBAs or sole proprietorships. Today we want to discuss something a little bit different that most people don't add in, so let me start it off with this way. If you see on this slide, you'll see a building being built. The problem is, is that most entrepreneurs, as I have said before, start with the roof first. They think it's because they call themselves a business or they call themselves a corporation or they call themselves a limited liability company that that's what they are, which is far from the truth. You want to make sure that you not only are called that and that your title says that, but that you act that way, that you manage that way, that you are operating like a business. One of the things that most people take in, don't take into consideration is, is that building a business is like building a house you have a side to the house. The first side that you have will be the legal side. And a lot of people pay a lot of money to attorneys to go ask the attorney what they should do. And they'll get some sort of advice. And many, many times also that they don't even ask an attorney. They'll say, my brother-in-law told me to do this. Or I have a friend who's an attorney that said this is what we should do. But a lot of people will actually pay a lot of money to an attorney. Then they say, oh, oh, I forgot I have to also dis um, take into consideration taxes. So the next wall is the tax wall. And we discussed that just a little bit at the beginning of this operation. Then the third wall is one wall that they don't take into consideration. And that is the estate planning. If you're going to do a business, what happens if something happens to you? What happens if unexpectedly you're called back to heaven or wherever else you're going to go to, right? What does your family do? In most cases, most families aren't prepared for this in the business sense. In the business sense, they have a last will and testament and they think that that's going to be sufficient. But that doesn't always cause smooth transition. You want to involve your estate in that smooth transition. You want to have a firm foundation. You want to have all the walls together and one of the walls ought to be your estate. And you need to have your estate be one of the owners, not the only owner in every case, but one of the owners of all of the businesses of one type or another. And so let's talk about that family estate. We suggest a trust. These are the businesses that we discussed last time, or at least we've discussed most of them in one sense or another. But we want to not have you not forget the family trust. Now there's two types of trust that we deal with. There are several different types of trusts. One of the things that we recommend is that you don't have your trust be a business. A business trust will pay more taxes than a corporation will. The, the tax rate is higher for a business trust. There are many types of trusts but the, what we're going to do is talk about two different types of trust. The first one is revocable or living trust. And the second is irrevocable or non-changeable. A living trust can be changed. A revocable trust cannot. So let me tell you a story. I was teaching this class several years ago in California and we, had, we were talking about trust as we were talking as we are now. One of the guys raised his hand and said, it doesn't make sense to me. He said, um, I went to jail once and they took everything I had. And I said, that's because you had a living trust. A living trust does not protect your assets. A living trust can be changed and can be moved around. And we'll talk about the individuals that can do that in a second. A living trust is great for management and it does fulfill the, the idea of having the state involved so it's a lot easier to manage. However, a irrevocable trust, meaning it cannot be revoked, 
is not a living trust. That means that the people setting up the trust cannot have any more control, cannot do anything else with the trust itself. There are three parts to a trust. In every trust, there's three parts to a trust. The first one is called the grantor or grantors. We recommend that if you are married, that both husband and wife need to be grantors. Grantors are the ones that set up the trust. They're the ones that dictate the terms of the trust. They're the ones that prepare or have prepared the trust document. They're the ones that set the beneficiaries in place. The fact is the trusts are usually provided to benefit someone or something. And that is the beneficiary. And then they also dictate who the trust is going to be, the trustee. The trustees are the managers. So the three parts of a trust are the grantors, the trustees who manage the trust, and they have to manage the trust based on the trust document. And then there are the beneficiaries. Those are the ones that receive the benefits of the trust. One of the things that I have people ask me a lot is, well, who owns the trust? Nobody owns a trust. A trust is a legal document that, and this is from layman's terms, you've got to remember I'm not an attorney, but it's a legal document that from a point of view is set up in order to protect assets which will be given to beneficiaries at a certain period of time. And the trust then puts the assets in trust. The grantors put the assets in trust, but nobody owns it. Grantors can make changes to a trust if it's a revocable trust or living trust. They're the ones that determine who's going to, what the assets are going to be, what the assets are going to be that's going to be protected. They put in place the trustees and they're the ones that dictate who is going to receive the benefits of the trust and when and how. The trustee then manages the trust in order to be able to protect the assets for the beneficiaries. They're the ones that are there by request of the grantors. Now the grantors can pay the trustees or the trustees can just do it because they're nice people. And I know there's a lot of nice people out there. So most times trustees are, benef are not beneficiaries, they can be, but most times they are individuals that protect assets for the beneficiaries and they do that because they're a family member or they're a good friend. It's like being the executor of an estate. But this is an organized estate, so to speak. It's a trust that takes care of the assets of your estate. Your estate is what you leave behind when you go to the other side. The beneficiaries now get to receive those things. And so the trust oftentimes will actually hold the assets in title or at least have assets transferred using a transfer document or a bill of sale or some sort of a deed that actually puts it in place. A revocable trust, like I said, is, can be changed. Uh, the grantor of a revocable trust can change trustees, can change beneficiaries, can put assets in and take assets out. That's one of the reasons that a, a revocable or living trust does not protect the assets. I've seen it happen on many occasions that somebody will be sued. They'll have a creditor come after them. They'll want to attach the assets and uh, they'll be in a revocable trust. The creditor can then argue and have argued on many occasions that because the grantor, who's the one that owns the assets originally and puts them into the trust, has control of the assets, the assets are not protected, therefore they're just an alter ego like we discussed before. They're just simply there for estate planning purposes, but they really belong to the grantor, therefore the creditors can take them offers no protection for assets. When we organize a company initially, we, we suggest to the owner of the company that's being organized that they start with a revocable trust just because we know that there's going to be changes have to be made. But later, as 
liability increases, the owner wants to change that trust to an irrevocable trust. Once an irrevocable trust is funded, funding meaning assets, either cash or some other asset, are then placed into the trust using the proper documentation. And a lot of times, if you're going to transfer property, quit claim deeds are not the way to go. That's been overturned and kicked back many times, especially by the IRS. So the grantor needs to have a vehicle to be able to transfer assets into the trust. That's a legal transfer document that shows that it's done with some forethought. But once the assets are in the trust of an irrevocable trust, the grantor loses control. Now, according to our trust attorney, a few years ago, there was a new law implemented, which I think is a marvelous law. The trustees are the ones that manage the trust. They're the ones that protect the assets to take care of the beneficiaries. But what happens if something happens to a trustee? What happens if a trustee becomes incapacitated or doesn't do a very good job or uh, something challenges the integrity and the ability to have that trust in place? The law now has allowed that under an irrevocable trust, the trustee, the, the grantor, not the trustee, can appoint a, grant, a trust protector. The trust protector has nothing to do with the trust. It's not a trustee. The trust protector is there to protect the integrity of the trust. It can make changes. It can add uh, changes to uh, beneficiaries. It can add changes to assets. It can add changes and change trustees. But the, but the grant or the trust protector cannot gain any personal gain from doing any of that. The trust protector can charge a fee for being a trust protector, but that's all that they can get out of the trust. And the, the trust can pay that a trust protector a fee. They also can pay a grant, the trustee a fee for doing that if they want, want to do so. Because of that reason, when you're organizing a trust, we suggest that you do not have the trust own any potential capital assets. Capital assets are those which can be used in businesses. Um, automobiles, uh, even your house, uh, furniture, um, computers, telephones. Those are things that you don't want to lose control of. And those are things that you could gain a business interest from and make money from and gain some benefit tax-wise from if you put them into the proper organization. But don't put them into the trust. Because if the trust makes money, it, the trust is going to have to pay the bill. They're going to have to pay a tax on that money. And so you want to avoid having the trust make any kind of money. It should not be a business. Seeing it as it is that way, the trust should be an owner of the corporation. It should be one of the owners of a limited liability company. And it acts on its own under the direction of the trustee. Now, to make sure that all of this works, there was a question asked of me some time back that said, if I don't transfer any real assets into it, what assets do I transfer? Is it just ownership of businesses? No. I recommend that everything that you own that is not a business asset that cannot be used for business be put into the trust, such as uh, pictures, um, mementos, tools, fishing gear, hunting gear, clothing. Well, what happens if you need to make changes and what happens if I buy some more clothes or I buy some more pictures or I buy something and then I die? Well, one of the other things that we recommend is that with the trust come a pour over will, P-O-U-R, just like a pitcher of water pouring what you own into the trust. The pour over will is different from a last will and testament because a last will and a testament, all, all wills actually have to be probated, but a last will and testament can be challenged. It's going to take a lot of, of legal action to be able to gain the money that you have due coming already. But if you have a pour over will, the, because the trust always already is one of the owners of the business, if you die, 
and your spouse dies or both of you die at the same time, what you own automatically pours over into the trust as though the trust owned it from the beginning. So the transition is smooth, the, the probate is minimal, and because of that, if there are things that you forgot to transfer into the trust by legal document, upon your death, it automatically transfers over. That makes it so that the trust will own everything that you own without having any problems. If you want to give things to somebody else, make sure you make a list and you give them away before you die.